We can respond. All right, we're getting there. All right. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Let's uh, begin in a word of prayer and then we'll, we'll talk together. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you that we don't exist only under the sun, but rather that our citizenship is in heaven. If we know you, Lord, that um, as we consider Solomon, his teaching and his writings on the, the vanity, the futility, the hevel that can be this world, that it would be a time that would drive us in consistency and deeper and deeper into uh, a relationship with you and a desire to please you in everything that is in our life. And we pray that uh, you'd reveal that and illuminate that in your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I, uh, a while back, was watching this TV show uh, that, that many of you might be uh, familiar with. It's called Undercover Boss. Anybody seen that show before? It's on, I don't know what channel it's on. I was going to tell you what channel it's on. I don't know. But uh, it's basically the premise is this. They take uh, larger companies and they find the CEO and they dress him up in like uh, different different disguises so that employees wouldn't know that he's the CEO of this large company. And then they find a bunch of entry-level employees and they have them train with these entry-level employees for a day each, right? Three, four, five, six employees. And they say it's for a documentary or a training video or whatever. They make up some reason that a camera crew would follow them. And then what they do is they follow these guys around that are uh, guys and ladies who are CEOs of major Fortune 500 companies worth millions and millions of dollars and have them watch and work with people who are making a lot of times just over minimum wage and how they interact with it and what they learn from it. And so the, the big reveal in the end of the show is that they're, they're going to pan in on these CEOs who have now spent some time with people that they, they probably don't normally spend time with and connected in ways that they don't normally connect. And they're going to go, okay, what results come of this? What are you going to do? And so there's always this kind of each employee sits down with the CEO afterwards and the CEO reveals who he actually is. Um, and, and if that employee was terrible and trashing the company the whole time, the CEO goes, I don't know why you're trashing the company. You're fired. And, and it works out really bad for a few people. But for many of them, uh, the CEO has this kind of realization of, you know, I've thought differently about things. And, and upon seeing this, it it really revealed to me some things that are, are different in my life. And one particular episode uh, was this guy who uh, was, was mid-50s, had been very, very successful, had worked himself up, was a self-made man at 18, had hired into this company, and had done almost every job within the company, and was ascending the ladder all the way to the top, uh, and believed, I think, full and wholeheartedly that that was the right thing to do, to work hard enough that he would have success, that he would reach the pinnacle. And what was really interesting is he spent a day training with someone who was uh, right in that entry level who was similar to his age had been there for years and years and years and there was this kind of dialogue inside of it that was um well, well, do you want to go further? Would you like to ascend? Would you like a promotion? Would you like this? Would you like that? And uh, this, this lady who he's training with is, is pretty consistent that, you know, though the, the money isn't great, though the benefits aren't great, though the job isn't all that meaningful and influential, that she's been able to really uh, raise up and be a part of a family and that she has this community both in her work and in her home that has been really wonderful. And, and I've I tend to think that this lady might have even been a Christian, but, but in this, she's, she's sharing all of this, and so at the end of the show, there's a scene uh, where this CEO sits down with his now adult daughter, and they're eating dinner, and he uh, begins to apologize, apologize for all the late nights. Apologize for all the missed games. Apologize for all of the birthday parties he wasn't at. Apologize for all of the sacrifices made in the name of family that actually was an abandoning of family for the sake of career and ascending the corporate ladder. And he says, some things have to change because I've realized, and this will stick with me forever. He looks at her and he says, I've realized that I've worked and worked and worked and what has come of all of my work. And so often, 
I think the reason such a thing would resonate with us is because we are encouraged and we're held in a culture and in a system and a society that tells us to do exactly the same thing. And it's in these moments of thought that we go, what are we really accomplishing in all of our labor? And what Solomon, 3,000 years earlier, is going to say nearing the end of his life, who's done this, and he's done it, by the way, better than you and I ever will, is all of this labor, if it's just under the sun, is meaningless. The word that he uses in Hebrew, we've talked about over the weeks, is hevel. It's a word to describe a cloud or a vapor, that it appears substantial, it appears real, and yet upon getting there, there's just no substance. There's just nothing behind it. And so as we looked at last week, what we said is just kind of the major issues that continue to show itself in Ecclesiastes is Solomon writing and trying to make this point not just about one thing in this world, but about everything in this world. That all of life under the sun, that's his way of saying here on earth, the tangible, the material world is hevel. It promises a whole lot and it continues time and time and time and time again to under deliver what it has promised. And not only that, but it's meant to kind of leave us with this unsatisfied feeling. It's, it's supposed to do that. He's going over and over and over again. I tried this and it was meaningless. I tried this and it was meaningless. I tried this and it was meaningless. I became wise and knew all things and found that to be hevel, vanity. It wasn't worth anything. I started to seek out pleasure and I went to strong drink and I tried that in a whole bunch of different ways and I found it to be meaningless and I tried laughter and thought maybe I'd just have some fun and enjoy myself and I found it to be meaningless and then I went to try uh, to accomplish a whole lot and drown myself in wealth and accomplishments and I just found that it was meaningless and so I tried to go to the pleasures of stimulation and found uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines and it was meaningless over and over and over again that all things were just without meaning or value under the sun. Now, he continues on throughout the book of Ecclesiastes and what we've said is, is what we'll see kind of in this is that we're not meant to just leave that there, right? Solomon is not the most depressing party guest ever who just kind of comes in and goes, everything's meaningless all the time and then we die, so what? Uh, but rather that he's, he's got a little more to it than that. He's gonna say if all of the things on earth are meaningless, then maybe we ought to consider that our lives' meaning will just not ever be fully defined by the things on this earth. Maybe our life's meaning isn't under the sun, but it's beyond the sun. Maybe we ought to consider that if everything on this earth will ultimately not fully satisfy, that our full satisfaction is beyond the sun, and that we ought to consider our meaning as someone who's created in the image of God, not just as someone who exists in this material world. And in doing so, the third thing we said that we'll see over and over again in this is it will lead us, this realization, to actually find finding real satisfaction and real joy in all of the things that are under the sun because we can see them in light of what God has purposed for us eternally, what God has purposed for us in Christ. And so the only way that we'll really have meaningful satisfaction, lasting joy and satisfaction in this world that hits on its deepest level is when we begin to see ourselves as someone who exists eternally beyond the sun. And so today, we'll, we're going to zoom in, uh, kind of go short, but just, I just want to really bring this into how he continues on from last week and deal with something that I think in our culture and especially, so when I say our culture, thinking United States, big culture, but especially uh, Southwest Wisconsin, rural uh, area where we exist in, uh, I think is a massively 
dangerous and idolatrous way of life that kind of sneaks in and creeps in among us and Solomon's just gonna call it out and say, I did it and again, it didn't satisfy. So we looked at all the pleasures of this life last week but Solomon doesn't end there as he begins to catalog the things that are hevel in this world. Pick up with me in chapter two, we're gonna be in verse 18 and you'll see how he continues and what he's going to kind of say he turns to next and how foolish it is. Thus, I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he'll be a wise man or a fool, yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is Hevel. Let me tell you a little bit about how Solomon's life path kind of walks out. Uh, as we looked at last week uh, in his uh, ascent to the kingship in Israel, Solomon becomes a great man really quickly. He asks for wisdom, God grants him wisdom and says I'm going to give you a great deal of prosperity and riches as well to go along with that wisdom in order that you might glorify me. The problem is uh, Solomon as he walks this route a little ways uh, begins to fail to glorify God. In fact he starts to kind of lose sight of God in all of it and instead begins to find life as completely unsatisfactory. In fact, uh, what happens is he just starts to get more and more and more and more and more of everything that you ever would want and he just doesn't find it filling, right? And so he, he begins to see a great deal of prosperity. He begins to see a great deal of peace. He begins to have uh, people who literally just worship him. They see him as the greatest king that the world has ever known. Uh, consistently, on night in and night out, he's feeding tens of thousands of Israelites in the court of the king. He is uh, experiencing a great deal of success like the world has never known. And he just doesn't find any satisfaction in it. And so he begins to kind of try to find some ways to party through that. He begins to try to find some ways to uh, build some extravagance through it. He begins to try to find some ways to uh, experience pleasure and deal with women as a way to kind of see what will ultimately satisfy me. And the problem is each one of those things begins to get old. And so in and amongst them, nearing the end of these things, he decides perhaps I can make a name for myself by working to accomplish a great deal. And so he begins to expand the kingdom. He begins to be a person who brings about a great deal of uh, safety, prosperity, and success in the kingdom of Israel. And then he begins to expand the works of his hands. He commissions and builds a temple to God. You see, up until that point, God had had a tabernacle, a tent of meeting, where the people would come and worship, and, t and Solomon goes, I'm gonna build a house, a permanent place for the Lord that would be one that is befitting of who he really is. And so seven years and 150,000 plus servants working to craft the most magnificent building that the world had seen to that day. And then on top of it, he goes, uh, now it's time to build my house. And 14 years of those same servants working build a house of Solomon that's described in the book of 1 Kings in First Chronicles with statues and monuments and massive monstrosities of silver and gold and pillars of stone and things that we just would uh, marvel at even today done with servants and hand tools. And he begins to plant forests and he begins to dig ponds and he begins to irrigate these forests and he begins to landscape and gardens and parks in ways that we could never even come close to. You might have a really great landscaping flower garden, but Solomon's building national parks, right? And, and in all of this labor, in all of these accomplishments, in all of these things, what he finds is that still he's working now and comes to this conclusion, verse 18 and 19. All of the fruit of this labor. I can look out and see my house. He had 700 wives build a house for each one of them. All of those houses, 
So I can look at the forests. I can look at the, the irrigated ponds, the pools of Solomon that still exist to today. The craters are still there. I can look at all of this labor and know that I hate it because it just doesn't fulfill the way I thought it would. And here's, here's the first reason he says ultimately that this will be so problematic because he's come to the realization that he's going to die. And there's just no U-Hauls going behind hearses, right? You don't put a trailer hitch on them, do you, Brent? I mean, he goes, all of this labor, and I'm just going to die. I can't take any of it with me. And not only that, here's what's worse. Someone's going to inherit all of it, and who knows what's going to happen then. He's, he's looking out, in fact and seeing some of the problems in the sinful toil that he has had in his life. You see, we said he had 700 wives. I'm not a math expert, but that's a lot of kids, okay? He's got a lot of sons, right? Now here's the thing, when you are the king, it's an important thing because your sons have what? They have a right, right? They have a birthright. They're in line to the throne. And if you have one wife, your firstborn son will be the king. If you have 700 wives, you have potentially 700 sons who are going, well, I should be king. I'm the rightful heir. In fact, there's so much uh, problem and controversy in this that Solomon's looking out knowing that the son that he's going to tap on the shoulder, Rehoboam, who's going to become king, might just be a fool. And, and another son, Jeroboam, who uh, becomes kind of a crafty guy, is hiding out and laying in wait to separate and divide and dis ultimately destroy his kingdom. What happens is uh, this very thing comes to fruition. Shortly after Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam becomes king uh, and his other son who had been in exile, Jeroboam, comes to him and goes, okay, we'll submit to your kingship, but you gotta change our labor structure. And without wisdom, his son listens to young, foolish counselors, takes their advice, and instead of creating some diplomacy and bringing and uniting the kingdom the way his father probably would, his foolish son increases with harshness the labor of the hands of Jeroboam and the ten tribes of Israel, creating a civil war that tears apart the nation just one generation after Solomon. All of my labor, all of the works of my hands, all of the things that I have done, and like that, it's been swept away by the wind, that this too is vanity and striving after the wind, that there's a futility, there's a hevel in us laboring so hard in our life under the sun because you're just going to die and you can't keep it, and not only that, but what's going to come after you is somebody who ultimately is going to make a mess of all that you've created. Uh, I was reading this the other day. Do you know that 65% of inherited wealth doesn't last more than two generations? 65%. You, you want to be a self-made billionaire? Chances are your grandkids will have squandered the last of that wealth. Two-thirds of the time. 65%. Most family businesses, same thing, uh, don't last past the third generation. Somebody builds a business, uh, the kids kind of see some of the hard work that goes in that and continues it on, but a lot of times the grandkids have kind of gotten that silver spoon in their mouth and what happens is when they take it over, it's squandered and destroyed. Just doesn't stand the test of time. Frequently, over and over and over again. Levi, I'm sorry, I'm just encouraging you. I see you back here smiling. 65%, okay? So be, be a difference maker, all right? Here's, here's the thing. The New Testament has Jesus giving an equivalent parable of this story. It's in Luke 12, he says, there's a land of a very rich man, and it produces plentifully. So much so that the rich man looks at all of his harvest and goes, 
I don't even know what to do with this. In fact, I need to tear down my barns and build bigger barns so I can store all of this grain in my, I, my goods and I'll say to my soul, soul, you've laid up many goods for many years. Therefore, life should be complete, right? Take ease, eat, drink, be merry. Life is good here under the sun. And Jesus' very next words are, you fool, for this very night your soul will be required of you. You're going to die. And the next question is, then who will have all of your grain and your goods? You're going to pass it on to someone and who knows what they'll do with it. You see, what Solomon is coming to the realization of is you could work so hard and it just, just might not amount to anything. And even if it does, you won't be the one to enjoy it. And then he goes on, and if that wasn't kind of drag you down enough, he says this, therefore, this is picking up in verse 20, I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, when there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them. This too is vanity and great evil. He's gonna go on to describe what he means by these two verses later in Ecclesiastes. In fact, it's gonna show up in Ecclesiastes chapter nine. He's gonna give an illustration. In Ecclesiastes 9, 11, he says again, I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift and the battle is not to the warriors, neither is bread to the wise nor wealth to the discerning nor favor to men of ability for time and chance overtake them all. He goes on to tell a story about how there was a really wise poor man in a city who saved the city from a certain doom and yet following that all the credit goes to the rich man and the wise man doesn't receive anything from it. Here's what he's gonna say. Uh, this is what he means by this. Even if you labor well, sometimes it's just gonna work out bad because you're not in control. Even if you are wise, even if you are swift, even if you work hard, even if you do right, this world is full of hevel, and so sometimes it's still gonna blow up in your face. Now, I know, I know it's hard to imagine uh, that there might be a situation where um, you get the fields planted on time and you do the right type of applications and you've done everything the way that it should uh, and everything looks the part and then by no control of your own, uh, some disease from Mexico shows up and kills all of the crops in four days, right? That would be hard, hypothetical. Can't imagine something like that, right? You didn't do... You didn't do anything right, wrong, and different. It's just beyond your control. It's just beyond your control sometimes that we could work and do everything the, the way we were supposed to do it and yet it doesn't work out the way you intended because it's just past what you can do. It reminded me, this, uh, this spring, I had this kind of realization of such a moment. Um, we, in the front of our house, our garage has like the floodlights, uh, the two-fold floodlights, and um, this little barn swallow decided that that'd be an excellent spot to begin to make its nest. And so I went out, and there's all this like mud and straw and hay beginning to formulate, and this bird is coming in, and, um, and you know, they're aggressive little birds, and so they kind of swoop at you, and I wasn't a huge fan of it, and uh, maybe I had a broom and was swinging at it. I don't know. But, but in that, I decided you can make a nest, but you're not going to make it in my garage. And so uh, I begin to get up there and I knock all of this mud and all this hay down and it's all on the ground. And I think this bird has probably worked so hard for two, three days and now all of its labor is gone. And you know what happens? It comes back, right? And the next day I walk out and there's a whole bunch more mud and a whole bunch more hay and a whole bunch more work and labor that this bird has done. And I think, what a persistent little bird. And I knock it all down again, right? I'd imagine that bird's first trip back went, what's going on, right? And it doesn't stop. So then the next day I come out and there's a whole bunch of mud and a whole bunch of hay and a whole bunch of clumps of a beginning of a nest. I went, you gotta be kidding me. And I knock it down again. And if the bird wasn't mad on the second day, you imagine the third day where it's going, what do I got to do to get ahead, right? So, sometimes you can do everything by the book. 
You can do all of this work. You can spend all of your life working hard the way that it is taught to you. Young people, you're told, go to school, get good grades, do well so you can get into a good college, so you can get a good job, so you can make good money, so that you can have a good life, so that things go the way you intend them to go. And what often you aren't told is for many of you, something's gonna happen on a Tuesday afternoon that is so far beyond your control that you'll have nothing to do with the fact that it will derail all of your life and your best laid plans. You can work and work and work and work and labor and believe that you're gonna do the right things to get ahead in this world. And it might work out. But for many of you, it's gonna explode in your face and it's not even gonna be your fault. For many of you, it will be your fault. But what Solomon is gonna warn is even when it doesn't, even when I got everything I ever wanted, it didn't satisfy. It wasn't what I thought it would be. And so, um, again, what, what's followed kind of the arc of this series is we could stop now um, and go home, be really depressed, sit in a t-shirt on our chair and eat Doritos and just not want to work for the rest of our life, right? I'm just going to watch the game in misery until I die because there's nothing of substance and nothing of value. Just, I would never, ever want Solomon at my house, right? Like, I mean, you just imagine him as the old guy in the corner who's going, it doesn't matter anyways, nothing is of value at all, right? But that's not, that's not where he ends. It's not what he closes with. In fact, consistently weaved in throughout his warnings about the hevel of this world are the directions that we're meant to be pointed to. In fact, he's going to ask this question rhetorically before he answers it. Look at verse 22 as we continue on. For what does a man get in all his labor and in his striving with which he labors under the sun? Because all his days his task is painful and grievous, even at night his mind doesn't rest, this too is hevel. He's going to ask, should we just give up? Because you just don't even get anything. It's just without substance. Ought we just leave it? But I don't think his answer is that. I think he's going to go on and give us a few things that we ought to do and we ought to consider as someone who exists in this world that has so many hevel traps around us. This is what he says. Verse 24, there's nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have employment without him, without God? Here's the, here's the first thing Solomon's going to advise. Uh, find satisfaction in what you are able to accomplish because if you ever accomplish anything through your labor, through your hard work, through your efforts, it is only allowed by the hand of God that you ought to find some satisfaction in the work that you're doing, not because you are so capable or because you can do it, but that God has empowered you and allowed this to happen. And so you might look and go, whatever labor I have, I can eat and drink and be satisfied that this is through the work of the Lord. This is the hand of the Lord. And then with this, this is something that, especially when I think our culture, small, rural, southwest Wisconsin, needs to be hearing, is you ought to labor in satisfaction at the hand of God, and you ought to rest in some satisfaction at the hand of God. That you will never labor enough to think, that your work has satisfied, that your work is sufficient, that your work will quench the longing of your soul unless your work and your rest come in understanding that it is God 
who is working all things together for the good of those who love him and for the sake of his glory. Not only that, but he's going to go on and say, who can eat, who can have enjoyment without God? For to a person who is good in his sight, he has given wisdom and knowledge and joy while to the sinner he has given the task of gathering and collecting that he might give to the one who is good in God's sight. This too is vanity and striving after the wind. The second thing that Solomon is going to point out in this is that the only labor that ultimately is of lasting value is the labor that's done for the kingdom of God. In fact, he's going to say that uh, the reality is that those who are good in God's sight, we'll get to what it means to be good in God's sight in a second, but he says that those who are good in God's sight are going to receive the benefit of the labor of those who are not, which is ultimately a reference that Jesus is going to use in parable when he talks about the talents later in the Gospel of Matthew uh, to describe what it looks like in God's kingdom, that ultimately this world, this under the sun, this hevel, is just something that we're stewarding while God tarries until he's going to return and we will reign with him. That ultimately, our labor, the labor that will last, is that labor which seeks first God's kingdom and seeks to do what is heavenly, the treasures that are laid up in heaven, not on this earth. And so, we, one, could consider that in the midst of all of the hevel of this world, you ought to find some rest and satisfaction knowing that it is created by God that we might labor and that in him we can find some rest and satisfaction in our labor under this sun, even when it works out very terribly for us. And even when we know that we'll one day die and we won't take the results of it with us. And second, that we ought to then use that to put that into the perspective of our lives to recognize that in the things that we prioritize, in the things that we consider important, in the things that we are laboring towards, that we would consistently be asking, how can we do this in a way that glorifies God? How can we do this in a way that makes a lasting difference in this world, thinking beyond the sun, thinking past this world? And third, the last thing and the most important that Solomon's going to get at here is describing that ultimately what's going to find value, the only thing that's not going to be vanity, hevel, meaningless, is to be a person who is good in God's sight. To be a person who knows the Lord. Jesus, um, when he talks about what it means to labor, what it means to work, uh, speaks about it in reference to who he is and understanding this concept. In Matthew 11, you, you can uh, let go of your place in Ecclesiastes. We'll end here. In Matthew 11, turn with me if you would. Jesus is going to describe what it means to know and follow him. I'll give you a second to get there. Matthew 11, starting in verse 28. Upon speaking to the crowds, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, all of you who have worked so hard and found no satisfaction in it. All of you who have worked to be burdened, to be weary, to be heavy laden, and yet can't find any meaningful rest. He says, I will give you rest. How so? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The yoke was, uh, well, probably don't need to describe it to you. You probably describe it better to me, but it was a way to tie together two beasts in the field. 
It was described in Jesus' day and used as a reference among rabbis to uh, explain that you would submit to them, that you would take upon the fullness of their teaching and bring it upon you. Here's what Jesus was saying. Stop feeling like you can just work hard enough that you can just do enough good things, that you can do enough work, that you can accomplish enough to feel satisfied because it's just gonna leave you burdened and heavy laden and in need of rest. And when you realize that, when you're willing to stop, you come to me, you take my yoke upon me, you place your faith not in yourself and your ability to do it all anymore. You place your faith in me who has done it for you, who lived the perfect life and went and died on a cross and three days later he rose from the grave so that those who place faith in him shouldn't perish but have eternal life. And get this, life abundant. Life that would find real satisfaction. Life that would find real rest for your soul. Not in any of your labors. Not in anything under the sun. But in Jesus Christ alone.